Hello everybody. Welcome to Blue Marble Science. You know, I'll bet you guys didn't know four sequels mass, did you? Well, Flat Earth seems to think so. Warning! Severe facial and monitor damage alert is in effect. Get out those oven mitts. Push the monitors back out of punching range. And let's light this dumpster fire and have some fun. The other day I had a chance to have a discussion with Chris Matt about the Cavendish experiment and about gravity. You see a picture of the original experiment here, along with a current day version that they use in universities. I thought this was interesting because I'm thinking about doing the Cavendish experiment, and I'll talk about that at the end of the video. But in the meantime, let's listen to the discussion I had with Chris and hear what his thoughts are in terms of what Cavendish showed and what it means. Okay. So um, from my understanding and, and what I've learned so far, the Cavendish experiment uses a torsion balance to measure the weak gravitational force between two lead balls. So basically what they're measuring is the twist in, in the torsion bar. Is that correct? Yeah, the torsion bar, uh, you're measuring the... the uh the torque actually in that wire and it's suspending the, the balance thing. Yeah. And that can be right. equated to a force. And, and you use like some kind of scale just to, to see the procession of that, that, uh, string, like you could put it against, uh, some kind of caliper or something to measure its movement. No, no you can't do that. The force is, is really, really weak. I it actually went back and, and took Cavendish's actual experiment in the actual dimensions and, and all the stuff that uh, that he was truly measuring uh, at that time. And the force of attraction, the apparent force of attraction between the, the lead balls is only something on the order of maybe 150 nano newtons. It's really, really small. But It's really weak. Yeah, yeah, it's very weak. On two masses right. that size, yeah, sure. Exactly right. So um, I just uh, posted an image in the side chat. Um, I don't know if, if anybody else can see that. Okay, so this is the, Cav the Cavendish apparatus um, right here. So a couple of questions come to mind while looking at this. So for those of you that might not be familiar with the Cavendish experiment, let me go through it very quickly. John Cavendish lived in the 18th century. He was a self-taught physicist and philosopher. And Cavendish inherited an idea from the Reverend John Michel for a method that would allow him to determine the density of the Earth. So that's what the experiment is all about. It's about determining the density of the Earth. The Cavendish apparatus is what you see here on the left. And it consists of a wooden case. I've outlined part of it there, not the bottom part. That would be a little confusing, but... That shows you the wooden case. And inside the case is a small, lightweight wooden beam. And that beam is suspended from a torsion wire. That means that the beam is free to rotate. Now, at each end of the beam, there is a small lead mass that is attached or suspended from the beam. So those small lead masses can rotate. Not a lot, a couple of inches either direction, but that's enough. The next thing Cavendish needed was a large mass. And one of the large masses you see right there on the right. Two large masses were suspended from a beam at the top which could rotate. Now that means we could line those two large masses up with each other in this particular view. They would be in the center of the enclosure and equidistant from the two small masses, meaning that their gravitational attraction would be equal on both of the small masses and there should be no deflection. On the other hand, if you rotate the large masses, they will come very close to being lined up with the small masses, in which case you do have an attraction. Now Cavendish was able to measure the amount of that attraction through a pair of telescopes that he had mounted that looked through glass windows, but not only could he measure the amount of deflection that resulted from moving the large masses in proximity to the small masses, he could also measure the vibration period because this torsion balance acts like a horizontal pendulum. So knowing the amount of deflection and the period of oscillation, Cavendish could then relate 
the density of the large mass to the density of the Earth. It's really a very ingenious experiment. We do that today, and you see a picture of a modern-day Cavendish device there on the right. There's the large mass. It's outside the enclosure. There's the small mass, one of the small masses, inside the enclosure. And instead of using a telescope and optically looking at a scale, today what's used is a laser. And that's reflected off a mirror, which is attached to the torsion wire. So the amount of deflection and the period of oscillation is easily measured. So this mm -hmm. is an experiment, obviously. And um, experiments have specific criteria that we have to follow, don't they? Or is, is there no rigid um, criteria for experiments? Well, this was uh, something that was done by Henry Cavendish in 1798, well before quantum eraser invented the scientific method. So, Right, right. But I wasn't referring to, to that particular um, scientific method. Because obviously quantum eraser didn't invent the scientific method. <laughs> I'm just being sarcastic, Chris. Right, right. But yeah, you you got criteria you need to follow, certainly. Right. So there has to be some type of criteria. Um, would you agree that um, in order to have an experiment, we need to have an independent variable and a dependent variable? Not necessarily for the, for what we're talking about here. We're we're measuring something here. That's what Cavendish is doing. You can call it an experiment to measure the the uh, force, the apparent force of attraction between two masses, if you want to. And we yeah. can think of, we can think of things that we could go back in in time. Remember, Cavendish predates any of this not any of this uh, uh, current day thinking about. Independent, the you know the step-by-step -step Betty Crocker cookbook method of doing science. Uh, you'll find that if you go through there, you can easily pick out things that you can say, okay, that was that was the uh, that was the independent variable. There's the dependent variable, et cetera, et cetera. Now that was an important point I was trying to make, and the point is everything we do doesn't have to follow the scientific method, especially not something like this. This is an experiment being done just simply to make measurements. Cavendish already knew that mass attracts mass. He was trying to make some measurements about the quantity of that. People like Quantum Eraser, Nathan Oakley, and Sleeping Warrior have poisoned the minds of these people to such an extent that they no longer can think for themselves. So now let's go back to this debate and listen as Chris tries to figure out the math involved. Right, right. Okay, so we got the equation up on screen. Um, and this equation represents um, what we observed before, which is the attraction force between the two masses, mass one and mass two. And uh, the R representing the resistance between the center of those two masses. The R representing the resistance. Now, no. this equation. No, R, R is not resistance. R is a distance. That is the distance between the centers of the masses. It's a distance? Yeah. See the arrows? Okay. That's a dimension Because I, I could have sworn it was the resistance between the two masses. I'm sorry, um, it's not. It's, it's a distance. What we just saw is a really good example of what happens when people who have no particular formal training in physics try to teach each other physics or try to figure it out on their own without looking back into what's been done before them. In this particular case, rather than looking at the Cavendish experiment, reading through it and trying to understand the way Cavendish went about doing what he did, Chris skipped to Newton's universal law of gravitation and then wrongly assumes that the R in the equation is resistance, which in physics is a material's tendency to resist the flow of electrical current obviously having nothing to do with gravitation. When you make fundamental mistakes early on in your thinking, those mistakes carry through to everything else. And that's exactly what happens next. I guess There's no have force to... that's causing that, that mass to be attracted to anything. Well, I guess we're going to have to agree to disagree. Right, right. You've got force equals mass. Yeah. 
force equals mass. That's what times you're doing. mass times acceleration. But when when you look at that equation, they're looking at acceleration as something separate from mass. But I feel like they're intrinsically linked to one another because the mass is accelerating, and without the mass, you wouldn't have acceleration. The only difference here is that you're saying that the acceleration is being caused by something else. Newton's universal law of gravitation and his laws of motion are a real pain in the neck for flat earth. They just can't stand having that around because those laws perfectly describe the universe we live in within certain boundaries. Obviously, we can't use Newton's laws if we start talking about very, very small things. That's what quantum mechanics does. We can't use them when we start talking about extremely large things moving very fast. That's what Einstein does. But most of the time, for almost everything that we deal with, Newton's laws work perfectly. Both Quantum Eraser and Nathan Oakley have recently tried to say Newton's laws are bunk, they don't work, they were thrown out with quantum mechanics. No, they were not. We needed another kind of physics to describe the quantum world. That's quantum mechanics. Newton's laws are still perfectly applicable today. Now let's talk about Newton's second law, and I want to state this the way it really should be stated. Newton's second law says the time rate of change of the momentum of a body is equal in both magnitude and direction to the force imposed on it. It says for a body whose mass is constant, we can write it as F equals MA. Now both force and acceleration are vectors. They have a magnitude and a direction. Mass is simply the amount of matter contained in a body, regardless of the volume of that body, or any other forces that may be acting on it. Quite simply stated, you cannot have an acceleration without a force. If a force is not present, acting on a mass, there will be no acceleration. And that's simply the end of the story. We don't get to argue about it. We don't get to debate it. It's just a fact. So let's leave that right there. I've been thinking for a while about doing a Cavendish experiment, and I would like to have some input back from you guys about whether you would like to see this done or not. What I would really like to do is go through the design of the apparatus, making it as similar as I can to the original Cavendish experiment then going through the construction of the apparatus and finally going through the testing and the mathematics involved in determining the density of the earth. If that's something you think you might be interested in seeing, it would be a series of videos. We'll consider doing that. Just leave a comment for me. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. All you flat earthers out there, remember when we say, how stupid can you be, that is not a challenge. That's a question. Hey, don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons down there. Either one of them, I don't really care. You can click the little bell if you want notifications when we put videos up. And there's a link to the Patreon account, and it'll be up in the description as well. With that, I guess we'll catch you guys on the next one. May I have your attention, please? The Earth is a sphere. That is all.